Welcome everyone to today's talk on water harvesting from anytime, anywhere. My name is Lauren Dijambri. I'm the Assistant Dean of College Relations and Development here at the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's talk. Today's talk is part of Berkeley Ecosystems, a new initiative where you can learn, explore, and connect with Berkeley faculty, alumni, students, and industry innovators on relevant topics. This month, we are hosting two talks, so we hope you'll join us again on April 28th for a talk from Professor Jeff Reimer on our changing atmosphere, evidence that demands a verdict. We hope you'll register in the link provided in the chat or later at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. Now for a few logistical matters regarding today's discussion. Today's panel discussion is being recorded as were all past events. In the coming days, you'll be able to find today's recording and other uh, recordings from past events at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. We are planning to field questions today towards the end of our discussion. So please use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function to share any thoughts or pose any questions to our speaker today. And finally, directly following our event today, you'll receive a short survey. Please take two minutes to uh, give us feedback on today's session and talk, but also uh, give us some ideas on future topics that you might be interested in hearing about. And now it is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Omar Yagi. Omar is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and has been honored with many awards for his scientific accomplishments, including the Wolf Prize in Chemistry in 2018, and recently the Royal Society of Chemistry Sustainable Water Award from the United Kingdom in 2020. Omar is currently the James Nilji Treader Chair, Professor of Chemistry at UC Berkeley, and is Senior Faculty Science at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Omar is the founding director of the Berkeley Global Science Institute and co-director of the Kavli Energy Nanoscience Institute and the California Research Alliance at, by BS, BSF here at the College of Chemistry. Omar's work encompasses the synthesis, structure, and properties of inorganic and organic compounds and the design and construction of new crystalline materials. He is widely known for pioneering several new classes of materials, one of which he'll be talking today, which are metal organic frameworks or MOFs. These materials have the highest surface areas known to date, making them useful in clean energy storage and generation and the production of water. Omar's work has led to the creation of new materials previously unknown in chemistry, and he has coined the new field of work as reticular chemistry. Omar is among the top five most highly cited chemists worldwide. And thus, I love to say, is always on the short list for a potential Nobel Prize. So thank you, Omar, for speaking to us today. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Lo. It's a pleasure to be here and to participate in this uh, important series. Um, I would like to share with you some of our work on water harvesting from air. And I also like to say that uh, we would like to do this anywhere and at any time of the year. Um, I hope that by the end of today's lecture, I will convince you that we have a method to do just that. So let me just uh, introduce this topic by way of sharing with you some of the important molecules that are part of the challenges facing our planet. Uh, our planet is facing issues dealing with clean energy, clean air, and of course, clean water. So hydrogen is a small molecule that when burned only produces water as a byproduct. So it's a highly desirable molecule that we need to figure out how to store. Carbon dioxide, let's say a child born today is breathing almost double the amount of carbon dioxide than a child born before the industrial revolution. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a problem and we need to find a way to pluck out carbon dioxide. And I suspect that would be the subject of the next talk you'll hear from Professor Jeff Freimer using metal organic frameworks. The third is water. And uh, water, of course, is essential to life, but it is one of uh, the most precious uh, materials. And increasingly, we are in need of 
water in arid regions and clean water, even in places where there is plenty of, of water. So, so let, me, um, let me just say that in order to address these vexing issues on clean energy, clean air and clean water, we need to think about what kind of materials uh, do we need to um, uh, invent or, or work with in order to address these challenges. But I like, to, I like to start by looking back and thinking about what are the materials that have been invented before and are being used today uh, to address the uh, problems that, uh, that have emerged in the last century and will emerge in this century. So I guess let's uh, talk about, let's uh, make a, a mental list of the most important materials that are in use today. I think you and I will probably agree that wood is a very important material, concrete, metals, glass, silicon, petroleum, plastics, pharmaceuticals, fabric, and paper. I would say these materials really are the most important materials today. And without them, we would not have fast communication. We wouldn't be able to fly planes and so on and so forth. So they have impacted all aspects of our society. However, I believe that the next generation materials to address the problems that I have been talking about in terms of clean air, clean energy and clean water have to be different, okay? And these materials have to be able to carry out a way to store those gases or and transform them into clean, um, clean fuels, uh, such as CO2 conversion to clean fuel or trap water, as I, the subject of this presentation, will be uh, trap water from air to deliver clean water. So I would like to propose that, in fact, metal organic frameworks have the scope depth and diversity to fill the materials gap that we are facing in addressing those topics. So metal organic frameworks, let me just describe what they are. They are made from metal units shown here in blue and organic units shown in gray. We also have covalent organic frameworks. They look like this except without the metal. Now, the reason I make the point that these are really the materials of the 21st century and that they are the materials that will address those problems is because of the great variety that could be made. Um, so for example, in this structure that I just showed uh, rotating, all the components can be varied. They can be changed, they can be functionalized to alter the pore environment and tailor the pore environment for very specific molecular binding, whether it's hydrogen, CO2, or water. And they can be expanded to even incorporate much larger molecules. So there's a lot of flexibility built into the chemistry that we have developed since the mid 1990s. So we call this chemistry reticular chemistry. And in, 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 in just simply stated is that it uses the component of minerals and organics, combine them together to make new porous materials as you see here. So this is truly infinite chemistry. Uh, in the history of humankind, there has not been a class of materials as extensive and as diverse as MOFs or metal organic frameworks. So it's infinite chemistry leading to infinite materials and infinite applications. Now, the a typical MOF, just like the one I just showed you, has an extremely high surface area, meaning that if I was to unravel a gram of MOF, it would cover an entire football field on the atomic molecular level. And it's that space that is available to trap 
molecules like hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and water. Okay, so in specific terms, a gram of moth can have a surface area of 10,000 meters square per gram. And that has created tremendous excitement because with the ability to functionalize the moth, the moth interior, and tailor that pore for a specific uh, function, then the possibilities are endless in terms of storing uh, gases such as hydrogen that are difficult to store under uh, practical conditions. But with MOFs, we are just a step closer to doing that. The same thing applies for CO2, to tailor the pores so that you can pluck out CO2 from the atmosphere. And indeed for water, to pluck out water from the atmosphere and concentrate it into the pores so that you can harvest clean drinking water. Well, you can imagine the excitement in the, in the world uh, about these discoveries. Back in 1995, where I started in Arizona State University, we made the very first MOFs and showed that they are, have permanent porosity and they can be crystallized and characterized fully. And that really launched the field. Today, the field has grown to encompass laboratories in over 100 countries around the world. So it has become a global activity. And this new field that we've created that I call reticular chemistry pertains to linking molecules together to make extended structures, robust structures, just like the material that I showed you rotating on the screen a few slides ago. So, so with, with this ability to design materials on the atomic molecular level, and with the incredible uh, porosity that, the, that these materials have, we can begin to address a formidable challenge such as the water stress in the world. This is a map of the, of, of the aridity map, let's call it, of the world. And you can see all the regions that are not yellow are water stressed. And in fact, one third of the world population lives in water stressed regions. And, and even in the regions where there is plenty of water, there are questions pertaining to water purity. So, and I think another thing to keep in mind is that almost 160 countries around the world import their water. So for many countries, this is also a national security problem. So our idea is that perhaps we could use the MOPs to address this uh, stress, this uh, water stress, because the current solutions, which um, already deployed successfully, such as desalination, they're great in providing water, but they also have tremendous environmental impacts, such as increasing the salinity uh, of water and uh, tremendous energy costs. Okay, there are desalination plants being built in the Middle East for uh, production of 1 million cubic meters of water daily. But the impact on the salinity of water uh, around those plants is, is tremendous and it's, it's not easily reversed. The other problem that we are facing around the world, not just in the Middle East, but in other parts of, of the world, uh, is that including the US, West, Midwest, and, and even uh, Western, uh, West of the US, uh, is that the underground water is being depleted at a much higher rate than it's being replenished. So that's another, another uh, part of the water stress. Even in some countries, as you see here in Sao Paulo, a dam is drying up and the UN predicts that uh, by the year 2050, almost half of the world population or excuse me, even 5 billion people, not, not more than half, 5 billion people around the world will be facing the water stress uh, problem. So, um, 
I think that there is potentially a solution and the solution is harvesting water from air. This is how much water is in the air at any one time. Three sextillion liters of water exist in the air at any one time. This is a natural resource that if we can find a way of trapping this water in the air, we would be able to use it and recycle it back into the air. And it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a completely recyclable resource. We are not destroying water. We are just using it and it is released back into the atmosphere. So the idea of harvesting water from air is not a new one. In fact, in many regions where there's a humidity in the air, high humidity, um, even natural uh, species can harvest water. This uh, beetle in Namibia, right off the, um, uh, in, in the coast there, uh, as there is fog, it can harvest the water granules on its back where there is nano ridges that nucleate the water and build up the water droplet, which then, as you see here, seeps down to, uh, to hydrate uh, the beetle. So that's from uh, fog regions. Other fog, in other fog regions of the world, um, there are these devices that are that trap fog just like sometimes you see on your window uh, screen to trap fog and collect, collect water. Again, this, is, this requires high humidity. Uh, also what requires high humidity are these machines that are sold uh, everywhere in the world for harvesting water from air. They work on direct cooling where the water in the atmosphere is, is, is cooled down and therefore condensed and then collected. Now, the problem with these machines is that they work only on humidities greater than 60%. So, so at the humidities lower than that, they don't work. And if they do, it's only for a limited part uh, of, of the year. So these are not solutions that work in the red regions of the world. You can see here that the direct cooling mechanism will not uh, be able to accomplish water harvesting from air in these red regions, exactly where you want water harvesting from air. These will not work because they can only work at high humidity. So there are no solutions right now to trapping water from air in an energy economic way, uh, especially by direct cooling. So our vision has been, how do you collect water from air anywhere in the world, not just the, even the red regions, but also the blue regions at any time of the year. So all year round. So I wanna show you our results in that direction. But first I wanna show you why um, it is difficult to trap water from air and collect it. Okay, so here's a psychrometric chart. I'm plotting here on the y-axis, the water vapor in air grams per cubic meter versus temperature. And I have colored two regions here. The green region is where, let's say you have high humidity and this yellow region or pink region is where you have low humidity. You see here, this is the line for relative humidity, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, and so on, up to 100%. As you reach this line, you get liquid water. Okay, so I wanna show you what happens if I'm in a city, let's say here in A, a city at 20% humidity and 30 degrees Celsius. Let's say I wanna cool that air to get the water out. To, to get to the water, to liquid water, to condense the water, I have to cool down that air from 30 degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius, okay? That's not very economical, that does not work. And it, it will, uh, it is not um, uh, a viable way of, of generating water from air. 
However, let's imagine that I have the moth that I just showed you, and I have the ability to trap the water in the pore and fill it up with, with, with water. What happens is that I'm creating humidity, okay? So the moth is taking up the water at 20% relative humidity, concentrating it into the pore. And now I have, let's say I have the moth in a container. I have a humidity that could be up to 90%. Okay, so increase the humidity by virtue of having the moth trap that water. Now, in order to get liquid water, I only need to cool down by a few degrees, four degrees from 30 degrees C to 26 degrees C. So, so if I can create a moth that takes up water from low humidity, then I've solved the uh, water problem in the arid regions of the world. And so this is, this is the, the, um, the results that I want to show you. But first, as I said before, there's been many attempts to do this before. There are many materials that are now being examined, such as zeolites, polymers, hydrogels, even molecular crystals, simple salts. And, and, uh, and none of them has emerged as a viable solution because in order to have a good uh, water harvesting material, you need to uh, meet three very important characteristics. One is that the material has to have high capacity. If you're not storing a lot of water, then you have to do many cycles and that requires energy. You need to have fast kinetics. Water has to be able to get in very fast and come out very fast. Otherwise, you have to wait a long time to get water. And definitely your material should work at low humidity. That this is the challenge facing uh, in the world in terms of water stress. So these materials meet one or so, um, but, but they really fail a lot in the other categories. So we were investigating the carbon capture of moths. And when you capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, you have to separate it from water in the atmosphere. And so, so you need to understand what is the interaction of water with the moth just, just as much as you have to understand how carbon dioxide is processed in the moth. So we were studying both molecules and trying to understand how the moths behave. And we made a discovery. The discovery was that this moth is able to take up water, let's focus on the red line here, take up water at relative humidities around 20%. Okay, that's low humidity and that's typical humidity in the desert. So that's one very important discovery. It means that the moth that we were using is able to pluck out water from low humidity. The second important thing is that the way the moth behaves when it's taking up water is in a cooperative fashion. So you have this very sharp step and then as the pore gets saturated with water, of course, you get a flat uptake. Okay, so this step is very important because it maximizes the amount of water, my working capacity, the amount of water that I can not just put in, but take out. Now, this, the third very important observation that we made is that the water that goes into the pore can come out. This is now the green line. When I heat the material to 45 degrees Celsius, it comes out in the same way it went in. Okay, so when I looked at this, I immediately realized that this could be a material that can be deployed in the desert, where at night, when it's cool, it can trap the water and during the day when it's hot, you can release the water. So unlike other materials like zeolites and, and other materials that take up water, um, they are extremely hydrophilic. Zeolites can take up water from low humidity, but you need to heat a zeolite up to 300 degrees Celsius to remove the water. Again, that makes it 
not a viable solution for harvesting water from air. But for a moth, you have the inorganic part, let's call it the hydrophilic part, and the hydrophobic part is the organic part. And this modulates how tightly water can bind to the interior of the moth. And therefore, we can modulate this strength very nicely and which allows us to then have the water come out at lower temperatures. So we cycled water in and out of the pore, as you see here, over 80 cycles, leaving no imprint on the, on the moth. Now, some of you may notice that after the first cycle, you see a slight drop in the uptake of water before it is stable in terms of uptake and release. This slight drop, when we look deeply into why is there a slight drop, initial slight drop, it gave us the secret for making moths for water harvesting. Let me elaborate on that. You can use X-ray, a single crystal X-ray diffraction technique and neutron diffraction techniques to look deeply in the pores of the moth and locate where those very first water molecules reside in the structure. And then we look at their interactions with the structure. So you see here for this moth, we found the water molecules shown here in red bound to the metal oxide unit or to the inorganic unit. And then as more water comes in, they make up aggregates such as these cubic aggregates. And these, uh, we find that these are the seeds onto which other water molecules come in and bind. So in fact, the water structure, these red uh, spots you see here are built up in the pore, almost like uh, ice, I would say ice chunks that fill the pores. And the key here is that the very first water molecules bind strongly to the metal oxide unit and they act as a magnet to the uh, water molecules that are in the air. Bring them in and bind them uh, and build the structure up of the water in the pore. So this was the key, the seeding effect, which uh, we attribute um, to the uh, excellent properties of the, of the mouth taking up water from um, low humidity air. Okay, so from the laboratory, we wanted to take this outside and show that in fact, this works uh, in, in the desert. So, so, so here's a device, this is, this is a very small device that only has two grams of moth. Okay, it's a handheld device. And the way it works is that the moth is put in the, uh, in the container and during the night, the moth is exposed to the air. Water from the air goes into the moth. And during the day, you close the container. And when the container is closed, you can expose it to the sunlight. And as the interior heats up, this is the interior of this box shown here, 50 degrees Celsius and increases 60 degrees Celsius and so on. And you see small droplets of water that are beginning to grow. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is basically a proof of concept that the moth works outside the laboratory at humidity. In this case, the humidity was uh, between 20 to 30% relative humidity. And so this was very, very exciting because for the first time one can it's very clear that one can trap water from air and take it out at very mild conditions with absolutely no energy input aside from sunlight. So we wanted to scale this up. So we scaled it up to a kilogram quantity of moth and we changed the design of the, um, of the device so that the moth, it's basically a box within a box design the interior box has the moth 
and that put inside a larger box. The larger box is open during the night to allow desert air to come in and the moth trap the water from desert air. And during the day, you close the outside uh, box, expose that to sunlight. As, as the interior heats up, water comes out of the moth and condenses on the walls of the, of the box. That's the, roughly the principle of how this, this works. Um, this, is, this is what this water harvester looks like. It's a plexiglass box on the interior and the larger box on the outside. They're both from, uh, from, uh, made from plexiglass, very cheap, easy to make. The box inside has the moth and the box outside collects the water. This is the experiment that we have run in Arizona uh, using one kilogram of moth. And you see here, these are, this is pictures of the walls of the outside box showing water droplets forming and running down and we collect the water. So for one kilogram of moth, we were able to collect 200, depending on the exact weather conditions, to 300 milliliters of water. Okay, so that's, that's one cycle between day and night. Okay, so at night you're exposing the moth, taking up the water, during the day you're releasing it. And the moth stays in the device and you can use it again and again and again. Um, our idea is that the moth is used over and over again. It takes up the water, it releases the water, you can collect the water and use it. And then you can start the cycle again and the moth can stay in, in the device for many years. The, the, the current idea is that uh, we have done enough cycles that the moth can stay in the device for, for at least five, five years, as I will show you shortly. But this was a very successful experiment because now I have a bottle of water produced by just having a kilogram of moth sitting there and no energy input aside from uh, sunlight. So the water is ready pure. It contains absolutely no contamination. It's a distilled, it's distilled water. And Cheers. Eugene volunteered to drink it. Nice. All right. Um, so we tested the, the water and it's, it's pure, which means that the moth is acting as a container to trapping the water and it is not contaminating the water at all. So the water to, to be drinkable, of course, it, it would have to be mineralized, but one can use it for drinking. And if, if, if you so desire, it would be mineralized, but also one can use it for agriculture and many other applications, just pure water coming out of the moth. Now, the power of reticular chemistry is that one can go in and uh, change the metals. You can go from a metal where in the, in the case of the moth that uh, Eugene was uh, using there, that's a zirconium moth and zirconium is, is, is expensive metal, but we can go in and make aluminum moth. The aluminum is much, much cheaper. And, and so we can design a material as you would see here, the moth is the backbone here are our aluminum oxide units linked by organic units containing nitrogen and carbon. And these are the water molecules that are diffusing through, through the pores. Now, how does this moth do? So we learned that instead of waiting for day and night cycle, we could push the air, just use a fan to push the air into the moth and and then with, with, um, with a solar uh, panel, we could have power to heat up the moth to release the water. Okay, so, so we designed a, um, a prototype that has basically uh, shelves of moth and it's designed in such a way that certain shelves take up the water from desert air while other shelves release it. Okay, and then it's condensed uh, on uh, a, a um, basically a powered um, condensation to produce liquid water. Now, how does this MOF CO3 
perform. So we took one kilogram uh, based device to the Mojave Desert, which is the driest desert in North America and tested it in the desert, okay? And so I would like you to focus on the relative humidity panel here and the, and the water harvested. And I want you to ignore the first point because this is the water that was in the moth from Berkeley. So that's released. And then this is the amount trapped in the desert. Okay, that's during the night. This is during the day, during the night, during the day and so on. Now, the amazing thing is that when you look at the humidity during the day, it dips down to almost 7% relative humidity. And you see how even at these very low humidities, the moth is still harvesting water. So for one kilogram of, of moth, we can harvest one liter of water. Okay, and here is a, Here's a video of the water dripping down in real time as it's being uh, harvested. This is the device. It's a sort of a homemade device, but deploying one kilogram of moth. And this is Nikita holding the one liter of water harvested. Okay, so, so this device can work over and over again. You can cycle and like I said, the moth remains in the, in the device producing one liter of water per day under these conditions. Obviously, when we look deeply into how the moth is working and how much water is going into the moth, we realized that the form in which we were deploying the moth does not allow the entire moth sample to be accessed by water. So we were only using a fraction of the moth. So in fact, the potential for much more than one liter per kilo was great. And the other factor I think that is so important is not only do you take up water very fast. So you see here, let's focus on this uh, purple line. You see that in less than uh, three minutes, the, the moth is saturated with water from the atmosphere. And in less than three minutes, you can remove the water. So this fast kinetics uh, gave us the idea that you can run multiple cycles per day. And so our next uh, uh, generation water harvester, it looks like this, um, is able to carry out over 200 cycles per day. Okay, and it's in, in this particular device, it only employs 100 grams of moth. Okay, so one tenth of a kilo of moth and delivers four liters of water per day. So this is a tabletop device and not much larger than a, than, a, than a microwave and is able to deliver four liters of water of pure uh, drinking water from only using 100 grams of moth that stay in this device for five to six years, graded for the lifetime of the electronics of the device. So this is just a short video of how this device uh, works. Um, you see this is a door that opens, air goes in, the moth is inside and as you heat, uh, later, the water condenses and it would be collected down here at the bottom. You see here a puddle of water that is then filling up this, uh, this, this bottle. Okay, so like I said, the productivity of this device is 100 for 100 grams of moth. You can harvest four liters of water. So, so we've gone from our handheld uh, device all the way to uh, this pre-commercialization, let's call it prototype. And we like to always talk about the amount of water per kilo. Uh, by the time we are here, we are at 100 liters per kilogram of moth per day. Okay, we have not achieved 100 yet, but we have achieved a significant percent of that. Um, 
I would say right now we're we're at about uh, 60 or 70 liters of water per kilogram of mop per day. That's real water that you can get every day from just one kilogram of moth. So based on those results, one can check the weather conditions in all over the world. And here I'm plotting the driest deserts in the world, the, the uh, Atacama Desert in, in Chile. And you see here at the most stressful times of the year, driest time of the year, you're still delivering water. Okay, that's around, let's say seven liters per kilogram of mop per day. Okay, those are the driest desert. And you can see that in a place like Lanzhou in China, in the middle of China, you can, depending on the weather, you can harvest still significant amount of water in the most stressed times of the year. Uh, Cabo, another, another uh, dry place, you see here significant amount of water can be harvested. And this is Riyadh in the middle of the desert in Saudi Arabia, you see almost 40% or excuse me, uh, 40 liters per kilogram of moth per day and so on. You can do this for Baghdad, New York, Stockholm, Los Angeles, London, Mediterranean region, Granada, Rome, Perth in Western Australia, Cape Town, and so on. Okay, so um, what, what this is telling us is that because the moth works at very low humidity, I showed you moth CO3 at 7% relative humidity, it can work at all humidities beyond that. And therefore, I think the vision of achieving water harvesting anywhere in the world at any time of the year is becoming real. And if you're worried that we're gonna be consuming all the water in the atmosphere, um, think about this. If we serve 50 liters to each person in the 6.7 billion population of the world, we would have only used 0.002% of the water in the in the atmosphere at any given day. So with these developments, what we are looking at is a distributed uh, process for water uh, delivery. It's mobile, it's off-grid. You can also personalize it to your taste. Um, the water that is produced is pure, so you can use it for drinking or agriculture or, or, or household use. And ultimately, my vision is that we as citizens of the world will achieve water independence so that we are not importing our water from other places. So that's basically my presentation. And I just want to conclude uh, by saying that I think we have developed not just new chemistry, but a wide range of materials and applications uh, that are addressing the water stress uh, in the world. And as I said, Jeff Reimer will be talking about how MOFs uh, uh, will address the carbon uh, capture challenge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, so much, Omar. And we have uh, a number of questions for you. And why don't I, I'll try to group them uh, in this capacity in the sense of, I'll start with some of the questions about your latest water production device and then get into a few uh, more technical questions about the MOFs themselves. Um, just one, you know, the, the MOF obviously you explained does produce pure water. Uh, however, would the quality of the air degrade the device, such as dust or grit that you might find in the desert? Uh, good question, Lo. Um, so the MOF, as you saw, is, is really a molecular filter. Mm -hmm. And in our case, it only admits water molecules into the pores. Even if you have, let's say, carbon dioxide in there, because water binds stronger than carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide does not stick to the to the material. Okay, so that's one that's one aspect to think about is that if you are um, 
in an environment where let's say there are uh, gasoline molecules, uh, you know, octane or that would not fit in the pore. So the pores are naturally filtering water in. The uh, second point is that we have tested uh, the, the last water harvester prototype that I just showed you without any filtration of the air. And the performance has been maintained over tens of thousands of cycles. Okay, so, so that does not seem to be an issue. Now, at the end of the day, if you really wanna filter the air, you know, there are fil uh, filters that, such as what you use in your automobile that could be used. So it's not a, it's not a, a, major, a major issue. And there's a couple questions here just about the cost of a liter of water. So um, I presume that's that's related to there's a fixed cost with the device, but then there's also the MOF itself that uh, presumably must be manufactured. Could you talk a little bit about what is the cost of a, a liter of water? So um, many people point to, you know, you see these beautiful illustrations of the MOFs, very intricate and uh, they look like they're very expensive, okay? Um, and uh, I just, I just wanna say that the variety of MOFs that could be made from all the way from complicated components to simple components to edible, even edible components, natural components is just, I mean, it's staggering. The variety is staggering. So you have flexibility in terms of going from, as I did, from zirconium, which was expensive, to aluminum, which is dirt cheap. Okay, so that that's works in your favor. The other thing that works in your favor is that that device that I just showed you, once you know how to expose, maximally expose the moth to the air, then you can get the maximum performance of them out of the moth. So that only deploys 100 grams of moth, 100 grams of an aluminum moth. Now, how expensive could that be? Aluminum is only $2 a, a kilo. And the price of the moth in general, unless the organic linker that you're using is very exotic, scales with the price of the metal. Because that's all I can tell you. Uh, because the cost of moths is, a, is, a, is, a, is something that is uh, held, uh, it's a secret held by the chemical companies that make it, okay? But that gives you an idea. You're not gonna be able to make this possible unless the cost of the moth is low or negligible compared to the rest of the device. So to answer the question in terms of right now, in terms of production of water using the device that I just showed you, if you assume that the electricity price is about six or seven cents per kilowatt hour, then, then the cost of one liter would be in the range of four, five cents, okay? So it's a fraction of what you would pay for drinking water. Now, if you're thinking that this is gonna replace desalination, I, I don't think that it will in the near, in the, in the, in anywhere in the near future, but it certainly can provide access to water for drinking and for agriculture at, um, in, in, in many places of the, of the world. Yeah, there was a question here. Um, sorry, I need to look for it in the, the number of questions we have about desal desalination. Um, and let me see if I can find it here. Uh, yeah, the question is, what, uh, what is the power consumption of the, oh wait, no, sorry. Um, let me see here if I can find it for you. Um, oh yeah, here it said, uh, what are the prospects for desalination using MOFs? And I read a report recently that a university in Australia had promising results uh, related to that. Is, is that something that um, might be a possibility? A absolutely, absolutely. Because you could, you could have the MOF in any kind of a humidity and it would trap, it would trap water. Okay, so, so yes, the results from Australia are very interesting using, using MOFs for this application. And I think once you start thinking like a MOF chemist, 
who's doing water harvesting, the number of applications are almost endless of what you can do once you know how to, how to pluck out water from air. And here's a question more about the mop itself. So is there kind of any rule of thumb to the rationality of the design of the moss for water harvesting? And one person kind of added on, uh, would you foresee kind of adjusting the moth for different regionality differences? Right, so again, very good question. Uh, some people are working on devices that have more than one moth for different regions of the world. Um, I think that, uh, let's say, if you have a moth that works down to 7% relative humidity, um, you may not want to operate that moth under that, um, that humidity all year, all year round under those, let's say, conditions. So you could design a moth that is going to give you a lot more yield under uh, a, uh, you know, a range of conditions and therefore uh, minimize your power requirements, your heating uh, requirements, and so on. So yes, you could do that. We are not doing that in these in these prototypes, but potentially there would be varieties of devices that would have different moths for different regions of the world. And those different moths, by the way, um, exist. Mm -hmm. They are out there. They've been designed and they are being deployed for that for that purpose. Um, I think the initial part of the question was about the design of the moth. Some moths are made by design and some are not. And I'm so happy for that because it allows us to go beyond our imagination, let nature uh, help us sometimes with, the, with discovering uh, structures that we, have not, that we have not imagined, such as moth CO3. Moth CO3, which is a very important moth, was not made by design. We just put the components together, but we didn't know it was gonna make that specific structure. But it turns out that that structure is ideally suited for all weather conditions around, around the world. So, so I think you have to have an open mind between design and then being, more, being humble and letting nature teach you what it has to offer. And I know, I know your specialty is obviously in the design and crafting of the moths themselves, uh, but there's a number of questions just about the device and, and the sense of how best to power such a device to, to enhance efficiency, maybe even with hydroelectric kind of uh, power. Can you comment on kind of what you have thought through in terms of the powering of a device to, to create water production out of moths? Well, I think the numbers that I quoted in, term, in terms of cost per liter, they're really based on a farm, a solar farm that uh, supplies uh, basically equipped with these, not this particular device, but, but this kind of technology that allows you to harvest water and then channel it to where, to where it's needed. Based on that, those calculations, you can produce millions of liters and, and then you can also bring down your cost down to one cent actually per, per liter. So, so that's, um, so we're thinking more solar, but obviously you could use wind, you could use any other uh, source, wherever might be available, might be convenient in that locale. Mm. Yeah. This is an interesting question. Just, um, I know you and I have talked about the future of chemistry and, and what your, your vision is about the future of chemists. Uh, is there a role for computational scientists in helping to make water harvesting via MOFs uh, a, a greater reality? Absolutely. I mean, I think in, uh, let, let's just take an example. In, in, in MOF CO3, we know exactly what makes it a great water storage material because we've gone in there and we've analyzed exactly where the water molecules are located, all of them, all of them, even when the MOF is filled with water. Um, that's a beautiful piece of work from my student Nikita. Um, once you know that, now you can say to yourself, okay, I'm going to create a MOF in the image of MOF CO3, but with larger pores so that it can store even more water. So right now, this moth takes up 40% of its weight in water. 
And a computational chemist could take that information and then simulate and calculate structures that take replic that replica, but in different arrangements so that the pores are a little bit larger. And if they are, it makes a huge difference. All the costs that I just showed, that I was sharing with you would be cut in half immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay, still operating under those weather conditions that I discussed, the extreme conditions as well as the normal conditions. Uh, I've always wanted to ask this question. Um, you know, so we, you've talked about using the moss for water production in very dry, arid as you know areas. But you know, we see everybody has now solar panels that are taking them off the grid of PG&E. Could you ever foresee an urban uh, application of moss to produce water so that we could unplug from East Bay mud? That's my that's that's my uh, vision. Right. I showed you. I showed you a device that works on no power except sunlight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you can imagine a box sitting out in a corner in your house and modulating between day and night. And for every cycle, you're getting that much water per amount of moth that you are that you're using. Absolutely no maintenance, no power requirements. Right. So. So I would say that that's, that is a very important development because it puts water off grid completely, right? But short of that, if you really, um, we are all impatient, we want lots of stuff now, then you plug into your solar panel and you can deliver water, okay? I mean, that's if your, you know, your solar panel is off grid, okay, so is your water. Right, but there it's connected to the solar power. But we have that other solution, which is the completely passive device that works on the day and night cycle. So that's another option that we are developing. Let me just ask this last question, which is, I mean, where where do you hope the study of moths goes? And and in that same vein, how would someone uh, you know, venture down into a career in some sense of developing and leveraging moths? I think what I stumbled through at the beginning of my talk with the old materials and the new materials, what I was really trying to say is that in the, in the whole human history, there has never been a class of materials that took everything that nature has given us and, and figured out a way to make new materials out of that. So to me, I can't see any other uh, class of materials as extensive as moths. So moths are here to stay. And for the last 25 years, since our initial discovery, um, there has been tremendous intellectual advances, not just in making the materials, but in also covering the entire periodic table. Almost the entire periodic table is now being used to make moths and coughs. Okay, so we're talking about new compositions, new structures, but also new applications. And so let, let's talk just very briefly about the intellectual advances. If a student is really interested in what is the future of moths and whether there's a career in moths. Aside from the fact that they are going to be able to address these vexing societal problems, these, I call them infrastructure problems, energy, water. Uh, if that's not enough, if you're just interested like me in, in, in just basic science, then you can think about designing structures as, as we have recently found that have sequences of chemical information that operate almost like a biological system where depending on the sequence of these chemical information, you can design the code for very specific properties. These could be carbon capture and converting the carbon to, to a fuel, or they could be things that are much more sophisticated than that, such as sorting, sorting chemicals, sorting molecules, separating CO2 from water or water from air in a sort, in a, in a, um, in a, in a way that allows you to do it without input of energy, okay? So 
uh, these sequence, what I call sequence dependent materials, I think is yet another multi variant domain that is yet to be exploited. And it's really there where the most exciting discoveries are being made today. Well, that is uh, fascinating, Omar. You never, you never seem, uh, cease to amaze me. And I just want to thank you uh, once again for, for joining us today and providing us this talk on the application of moss uh, for water production. I want to thank you all that joined us today. We had a great uh, number of people that joined. Please check us out again at ecosystems.berkeley.edu and register for future events and also to access recording of past events. Quick reminder to fill out the survey uh, that you will receive later today. And I just wanna wrap up as always from Berkeley with a big Go Bears. <laughs>